Hey, what's up? What's up? How you guys doing out there? Welcome to another episode of Funk Music with Zach right here on IBMTV.TV. Thank you for hanging out with us. I want to thank all the all the sponsors at IBM, um, the IBM Dollar Tree Store. And thank you guys for doing that, Mr. You know, Lynn Shepard and all that good stuff. Hello, Kim. Hello, um, Nick, the producers and Ann Kid and Wynn and my man behind the glass, my funk brother from another mothership, Mr. Mark Lee back there. Today, I got two, and I mean two special guests for you. Um, we're going to kind of do a little bit from my other network and my other show yesterday just to catch some people up on some things. And then we're going to jump right into what happened at the Capitol this week. My very special guests today are Ms. Brenda Woods, Club Funketeer Ambassador and World Renowned Activist, as well as skating, um, how can I say, professional <laughs> impresario, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, and we're going to get all into that good stuff. So thank you, Brenda, for popping on. I'll get with you in a minute. And also a real treat. My good friend from D.C., um, D.C. correspondent, D.C. insider, um, you know, Mr. Bill Tresvon, that I'll be doing some work with and have worked with in the past and going forward in the future, we'll be working together. Now, Bill and Brenda don't know the thing that they have in common, which is they both work for President Obama and Michelle Obama. So we're going to chop that up a little bit. Bill will be joining us about 1230. Um, he's still celebrating his Buffalo Bills win yesterday. So I know he's, you know, he's just getting it together. Love you, Bill. Um, you know, I'm only kidding. You see, I got my bear stuff on today. Uh, I got to let you guys know. So, you know, I'm a Jets fan, but Walter Payton has always been my favorite player. Um, in the NFL. So this is an authentic, official Walter Payton throwback. It is one of my prized collections that I have in my jersey um, collection. And also, I'm going to be rocking my Chicago hat today for all my people in Chi-Town. I love you. Right now, I'm going to bring on my guest, Miss Brenda Woods. Why don't you pop in, roller skate on in, and see what we're doing, what we doing today. How you doing, sweetie? Looking hey, as lovely as ever. Doing great. Doing Look great. at that doing beautiful great. smile. I hope the world and people in Dubai and India watching right now, it's nighttime for them. So they are going to go to bed with such a beautiful, beautiful woman in front of them. So you are so beautiful. Um, smile that lights up the world, you know, eyes that sparkle, you know, like cameo sparkle in your eyes. <laughs> Yo, uh, I got to tell you, I love you. And, um, you know, thank you for, you know, making a second appearance on one of my shows is is really, really beautiful. Um, and we're going to get into all the things that we didn't get a chance to chop up yesterday. Um, but I wanted to start because um, we were into some things and, and we were talking about the benefits of line dancing. So before we even get started, this goes out to Cheryl and Danita and um, Shawana and her crew from yesterday. Um, and I hope you don't mind, Brenda. I just wanted to run this video for them um, because oh, yeah, it has a lot okay. to do with the club Funketeers and we're going to get into that. But I kind of wanted to get this out the way, um, you know, and then we're just going to go ahead and chop it up. So Mark, throw that up for us while I sit here and stare at this lovely lady. See, Mark, he doesn't get a chance to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I get a chance to do it. So I can do this and I can do that and I can flirt with you and Mark cannot. <laughs> he's going to be mad. He's going to get me later. He is. He's definitely going to get me later. Yes. But this is um, SOS and Friends, the power of the one. So y'all check this out, man, and get your day started with some line dancing with the, these these lovely people. You know, this is really cool. Uh, Bootsy Collins, of course, and Friends is going to get into that in a minute. Then you would try to fit your different notes with yourself in between it, like, you know, and that's the bomb, you know, you know, and you can change that, you know, and that's the bomb, and you can change that. <laughs> Oh, you know this song is just because you can live. 
Yeah, that's the power to one with the SOS steppers. Thank you, Mark, for bringing that up. That goes out to Danita and Cheryl and Shawana and all of their crew and everybody that's hanging out, working in as a Boosie Collins Funk ambassador and administrator. And that leads me into Miss Brenda Woods, one of my special guests today. Brenda, um, welcome officially to the show. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. I know we have so much to talk about today. Um, how are you and your family doing up there in Ohio? I know you're from the Natty. So what's going on up there? Yes, we're doing well. We're keeping our eyes on what's going on so we can deal with the situation as it presents itself. Right. That That's what's up. And and I think that, um, you know, um, everything that, that we went through and have to deal with as people have really heightened our awareness, you know, um, you know, since we became friends in this life again, you and I have talked, you know, a little bit here and there on the phone about things and we all feel the same thing. And, and again, I'm grateful, you know, and thank you for your energy and your love and your warmth and all of the good stuff that you do. And I wore this, you, I, Mark will tell you, I never wear red, white, and blue to rep the flag unless it's a flag repping day. But today I wore my, cause I always wear something on my head, right? That's kind of like my thing. And I wanted to wear it because I felt, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or right before we get into um, Club Funk or Tears, but tell me, do you feel a sense of renewed patriotism because of what happened? Or do you feel your patriotism waning in light of Biden? And 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 Camilla giving us hope. What what do you, where are your feelings on that? Okay, it never waned. Okay, I think the thing with me is that you have to be stronger in your resolve and push the things that you know need to happen and should happen. And the only way we can do that is to remain vigilant, pay attention. This was not a surprise. Yeah. If somebody tells you, you just wait to the six, it's going to be wild. That was your signal a week or so before it even happened. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And and, and you're absolutely right. Attention. You're absolutely right. And I love that word you use, resolve. I just wanted to tell you, you see me waving. I'm not really going crazy. I'm waving at people that are that are on the bottom and the thread, like my man Lance and Bro. So when you see me waving, I'm not I like- I was wondering, what, what, 
Was that a hand eye, sign signal or what? To run or what? <laughs> no, no, not at all. If anything, I would be waving you in, okay? I'm a single man. I'd be like, hey, I'm waving you in. I'm not saying bye-bye. I'd be saying hello, okay? But no, if you see me doing that or doing something, I'm all, I don't want to interrupt your flow, so I always wave at, at my people that pop in. So my man Lance out there, thank you for tuning in. Um, Miss Brenda Woods, amazing woman. So yes, Brenda, you said a very important word that that's special to me, that word reason. Resolve. You know, not everyone has that strength a lot of times. So tell us, how do you and and I know you you know you you can get into it because we got plenty of time. How do you how did you become this resolving resolving strong black woman in a climate that has always been pressed up against you not being that? Well, I really have to say the way I was raised, my parents instilled in us in a young age uh, the necessity to pay attention. They used to say that all the time, pay attention, pay attention. When you do that, you're not surprised. You already in the back of your mind have a way to deal with things, even if you're dealing with them or not. Yeah. You've got a base. Yeah. Uh, we were brought up uh, in a predominantly Black neighborhood, and mm -hmm. then they started uh, redrawing districting lines for school. And so our parents put us in an environment where we were one of probably six Black children in a school. Wow, wow. So from that time, there's always been a little something, uh, but with encouragement and the way we were raised, yeah. you're just as good. Or sometimes you're better, but don't tell anybody that. that yeah, yeah. This, was, this was in Ohio, right? This is in Cincinnati. Okay. You know what? I And I, too, um, on, in, in a town called Bayshore, Long Island, I, too, was one of maybe 20 Black students in an all-white um, elementary school. And we lived right across the bridge, but there were four or five different elementary schools in Bayshore. And just so happened to one that, you know... Um, I went to school in was predominantly on that borderline, you know, and there weren't a lot of really black people in there. I remember my kindergarten class, there was only three black kids in my kindergarten class, you know? Um, so it was sprinkled, but I, I say that to say, I think it actually made us aware at a very young age of what we were going to be dealing with. Um, when you did get a chance to go to an integrated school, um, I'm not saying good, better, and different. I just know for me personally, it made me aware, like, wow, you know, I'm completely outnumbered here, you know, so I better be good at something. And I did. I got good into music and to sports because I was like, man, I'll get lost in the sauce. So when you were going and getting into the school that you were in, how did they treat you? Did they treat you nice or, you know, how was that? I will have to say, for the most part, uh, the treatment was very good. Cool. Uh, cool. Just just a few little hiccups here and there. But overall, you know, we, we were in the orchestra mm -hmm. in elementary school. We did Girl Scouts. We did all of those things. Okay. And we never felt uncomfortable. Right. But our right. mother uh, told us the treatment may be a little strange, but you don't just uh, you don't hurt people because they're different. They're yeah. different. And she was on the thing of they're different than us, than us not we're different from them. Yeah. And yeah. it's just a way to look at things. So we had a very positive experience uh, desegregating that school. Right, right. Yo, that, that's, that's, that's yeah, that's history. Um, and you should be very proud of that. Not a lot of people can say they paved the way. So, you know, um, you're a trailblazer. And for that, I salute you, you know, because I can't imagine what that was like. Because by the time I went to elementary school, Black kids had already came through there, even though there weren't a lot. And there was only one Black teacher in my elementary school from kindergarten to um, fifth grade. You know, and I was fortunate yeah. enough to have her in third grade, Mrs. Twyman, you know, and her 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 husband was the black football coach. So he used to always scare me because I was only like in third grade. And he used to be like, by the time you get to sixth grade, you're going to be on my football team. And I, he used to pop his head in and just yell at me like that. And I was like, who is this crazy <laughs> man yelling at me? I'm playing peewee football and he's already got me like a freshman. I was like, I better be good. 
you know, and I, I did my thing, but it, I just remember because she was the only black teacher in the whole school, you know, and wow. yeah, and 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 I was like, you know, and my dad raised us to be, you know, um, multiracial. He didn't care. There were white kids behind the fence. There was Latin people up the street for me. You know, he was a supervisor. So at the town of Islip, so he worked with all kinds of people. So I would always see different people coming home in my house because my dad was a union rep. And they would have union meetings there. And I Italian people and, you know, Irish. And I would hear them ethnic this and arguing that. And I'd be like, okay, this is the real world, you know. So I was, I was pretty fortunate. Like you, I had that, that good experience early on. You know, my father, minister and everything. I'm a PK. So that explains why I'm the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold it against me. Don't no. hold it against me. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> You know, in PK, <laughs> we split right down the middle. We can't help it. <laughs> we was raised with the with the bourbon in one hand and the Bible in the other. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you just made me think about the one black teacher that we had uh, in uh, elementary, Mr. Gordon. He yeah. was a gym teacher, and he was he was our our one black face that we could find in that whole school. But the environment was was so nurturing. And our mother uh, would always impress upon us the fact that you're you're really smarter than all of them. Now you got to go prove it. Yeah, yeah, and you got to work twice as hard. That's right. So we had that early on. So you know, when we when it came around to the riots in Cincinnati in '67, uh, we were standing uh, out at the bus stop with our little dresses and black patent leather shoes. That's where I get that dressing from you all, my mom. <laughs> okay. Uh, the uh, National Guard trucks rolled up our street and pointed their rifles at my sister and I. Now we're uh, fourth, and si fourth and sixth grade. And this is how the training was back in those days. We weren't afraid of the guns in the truck. We looked up at our mother who was looking <coughs> out the window mm -hmm. and said, mommy, what are we supposed to do? And she, and she, she's yelling out the window, they're just little girls. They're trying to go to school, leave them alone. And you know, when mommy wasn't scared, we weren't scared. Right. But by the time lunchtime rolled around and at school, our mother took us out of school and sent us down south with a son. Right, right. She said, right. oh, no. But that's the thing, though. Uh, that, that strong parental influence. Yeah. Really, it, it, can't, be it can't be understated. That's true. Um, it, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, you, you were more worried about your mom looking and 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 asking her for that guidance and wisdom and that's what moms do you know um that's what makes you know women on this planet so very very special i always hold you guys in the highest esteem you know um i really do because and you know especially minority women you know and successful minority women um you know just because of the struggle you know, and I know the struggle is real. So, um, you know, I just want to, again, thank you for that and your courage and everything. So <laughs> we were talking the other day and, and I have to tell this story. And you were saying, you know, you into the music stuff and we got I'm, I'm leading up to how you met Patty and Bootsie. But you told me a story about a particular song and how your parents was not having that. So so tell us. Miss Brenda Woods. Here we are hanging out with Club Funk, the ambassador and activist and all this good stuff, Brenda Woods. And we got Bill Trevan coming on at 1230. Welcome to everybody hanging out on IBMTV.TV on Funk Music with Zach. Um, I guess at the moment is Miss Brenda Woods. She's getting ready to tell us this little story um, about that experience, about your Funkadelic song. Because I know it's, oh, it's amazing. I love that story. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Uh we were a very musical family and we would have jam sessions in the basement. We were also, uh, our parents kept a close rein on us. So we were always had eyes on us. We knew 
that my mother would not like that song, Loose Booty. <laughs> and I don't I know why it. I thought I was slick because I always would blast my music down in the basement. <laughs> But when I put on Parliament Funkadelic, I turned it down to a whisper. Mm. And my mother was like, I know she was like, she ain't slick. My mother came down those steps and I couldn't get to the uh, stereo quick enough to turn it down on her. She went off on me. And I said, can, can we go to the Parliament Funkadelic show? She said, you're not going to that loose booty stuff. I'm really cleaning up what she said. You know you're not going to that loose booty stuff. Loose booty? What the hell is that song about? You trying to have a loose booty? that We're not having that in here. I'm like, I'm just listening to the song. That ain't no song to be listening to in this house. On and on and on. On and on. And we go, um, I think I had to be 14 or so when that happened. We go from there to me being in a position to get my 91-year-old father up on the stage with Bootsy at the launch of his uh, brew, his beer. Yeah. And my father is singing, I'd rather be with you arm in arm with Bootsy. So yeah. who says things can't change? But the, that loose booty song, <laughs> singing with the man. So, that is a great, great inside story because when we talked about it, you know, and I mentioned, I was like, hey, when we do an interview, I'm definitely going to mention that because I think that's the epitome of full circle, you know, to go from that to having your dad, you know, um, at that age, you know, be arm in arm with, you know, the Funk King legend, Bootsy Collins and all the stuff that him and Peppermint Patty do. And, you know, that is an amazing, amazing thing. I, I tell you, um, it's true. The power of, um, and you can elaborate on this, the power of projection and and manifestation is real. And, and I tell all you people out there, and again, always I'm going to thank everybody for tuning in on Funk Music with Zach on IBM TV. TV. Thank you to our sponsors and all that good stuff. Um, Lynn Shepard at the IBM Dollar Store. The power of manifestation and projection is important because I used to have... Um, the P Funk poster on my wall, right over my bed. I had it like on an angle, so I would wake up looking at that, right. And then I had another <laughs> one on this wall, and I always said, and then I had another poster of Hawaii where I wanted to always go in Hawaii. And I was a little kid, and I always said, you know, one day I'm gonna be doing stuff like that and and be involved with them, you know. And hi Kim, how you doing? Um, thank you, and. Um, that was just one of our producers, Kim, um, jumping on with us. But I always said I wanted to be involved with that. And sure enough, you know, through hard work and perseverance and, you know, just believing, you know, um, it, it came to pass. And I'm grateful because I thought back as a kid, like, had I not ever done that and believed in myself a little bit, it never would have happened. So, you know, your dad's on stage with Bootsy. Is that when you first got involved with, with Peppermint Patty as far as working in her foundations or being an administrator at Club Funketeers? Well, actually, uh, I had a, a convoluted way that I uh, met Bootsy and Patty. Okay. Uh, one of my friends, uh, I used to love to go to uh, the jazz clubs, live jazz performances, and got introduced to Catfish, Bootsy's brother. Ah. And uh, there was a group of us that would go to the jazz club every week or so. And uh, he would always listen to me with my service projects through my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha. And he says, well, Bootsy's doing uh, this, that, and the other thing. Why don't you come with me? Okay. So I did not meet Bootsy through music. I met him through community service. Awesome. He, he would uh, have events at music stores. He would uh, he would just be out and about in the community with our daily bread to help uh, people get a meal, get yeah. product, get those things. And I said, that is so interesting. Nobody knows about this stuff. 
And that's how I met Bootsy and Patty, was through our daily bread, helping serve those people through the soup lines. Yeah. And that's yeah. how I met them. And uh, so kind of an odd way to uh, meet such a musical icon. But yeah. that's how I did it. It was through community work. And I really yeah. got to see the heart of Bootsy and Patty. They are so kind and giving. Yeah, they're so are. willing to donate of themselves to help the community. That's how yeah. I met them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's amazing because, you know, being from the musical side of it, but I always knew, and we get ready to bring Bill on in a minute because that's why I was saving the political stuff because we got some stuff to chop up, you know. Um, but um, when I when I first understood their philanthropy giving i had recognized that early on a lot of musicians always did that but bootsy was one of the few in the black community that was worldwide and worldwide known and respected only and other people were too don't get me wrong but as far as funk was concerned he was like you know because like i said when funkadelic and p-funk and bootsy and all them went into the rock of a hall of fame all of us that was supporting them over those years, we were always the ones that were like, wow, we got one of us in there. It was like breaking the color barrier for, you know, because funk music, it, it wasn't even really getting airplay in certain areas in New York. They wouldn't play a lot of it. They just play the stuff. They wouldn't play the stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that, you know, Pepper and Patty. Here at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At home, you guys were getting the good stuff. We were not. We were getting the generic <laughs> punk. But it was okay because I used to get my stuff from audio file and I used to go to DC and Jersey where the funk really was. I used to get mine, but it was never on the radio a lot. And and when I realized their entrepreneurial spirit and worldwide appeal, you know, Paris and Germany and here and there, doing all this stuff and getting this club funketeers thing around the world and Patty making it global and doing stuff. You know, my daughter still got their little t-shirts when they was babies that, you know, Patty gave me at the concert years ago when Kayla and Maya was three or four. I was watching all of this stuff and I was like, you know, that's something to inspire, to be like and inspire others. And, and I was so grateful and blessed when, um, Patty called me and asked me to be an ambassador, you know, and it, it all happened at a really good time because, you know, things were really crappy right here at Durham for me. So I was like, wow, you know, maybe this is the God's way of, of giving me some hope, some light in, in my own lane, the funk lane. And I, I I am so grateful to people like you and, you know, Peppermint Patty and Boosie and all the stuff that you guys are doing. Um, I don't know if Bill is there yet, but I feel that he might be. He's itching. And and again, we're hanging out with Brenda Woods, you know, um, Club Funketeer Ambassadors member and administrator and doing some good stuff with Peppermint Patty. And, you know, she's been just about to every major concert and every venue and hanging out with all these people from Verde White to everybody else. So right now, without further ado, because we got a lot to say, look at you guys. See, you may, I, I am the bum. Obviously, my audience looks at me. I'm the bum. I got clean and cleaner <laughs> over here. You know what I'm saying? I come through like the street that I am. And and you wouldn't have it any other way on Funk Music with Zach. It's all good, baby. Um, Dr. William F. Tresvant, Esquire my political guru brother, Washington inside and all that good stuff. I want you to meet Miss Brenda Woods. Miss Brenda Woods, I Hi. want you to meet Bill Tresvant. Um, he's a friend of mine. He's Hi. a friend of the shows. And I was telling Brenda before, I don't know if he was on, Bill, you guys have something in common. And I'm going to start here. You both worked for President Obama. Okay. Well, I was on the campaign side. How about you? Uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, good afternoon, Brenda. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Good to meet you, too. Uh, Zach has elevated me quite a bit. I was on the local grassroots level uh, with the get out the vote, the phone banking, the door knocking, that That's grassroots face-to-face uh, -face situation okay. on, uh, on both terms. Okay, where? Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, because I, I was the same level, but I was in uh, Denver. And so we were in that uh, critical swing county in Denver back in uh, 12. And then prior to that, I was doing field operations uh, across the United States. So, yeah, I get you. It's that um, it's where you close the deal. You knock on the door and you say, hi, how are you? 
you know, because it's funny, you know, we, we and I apologize, the audience may not know, but let's just try it this way. And that is that um, in the campaigns currently, they have uh, a bunch of people that sit behind computers and they identify stuff and then they come up with these lists and they say, these are the lists of the people that we've got to get out to vote. And so they think their job is done. OK. And then on election day, they say we're brilliant. And what they forget about is they forget about the people that are walking door to door, that are knocking, that are handed out, sometimes getting no's, sometimes answering questions. Sometimes it's a five minute conversation. Sometimes it's a half an hour conversation. Sometimes you think, you, you know, you're there and it's either cold or wet or rainy or it's a hot day and you're looking at that hill. And let me try this, Brenda. I'll just this is just me sharing. But when you have your walk list and there's that one address that's left. And you look at the road, and that when I was in South Carolina, uh, most recently for Biden, that one last number would be 118, and it's way up at the top of the hill. And you look yes. at your, you look at your feet, you look at that number, you look at that house, and you think it won't matter. But then you get that second urge, you go all the way up that hill, yeah. that right. door hanger, and you hang it on the door, you ring the doorbell, and you wait. Am I right or no? You are absolutely right. And I couldn't go to sleep at night if I had disregarded one one door or one person. Uh-huh. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I was also that uh my friends called me an Obama stalker. If he <laughs> came <laughs> from anywhere between Cincinnati and Columbus, I was on the greet line because I would get there at dawn and camp out. <laughs> okay. Okay. just couldn't get enough and a lot of times I'd have my dad with me who was in his uh, late 80s during that time and he loved President Obama and he just said he can't believe he's living long enough to see all this happen uh huh you know it was the uh, it was the same thing my mother was uh, well uh, the 08 campaign um uh, uh, my mother was up in years, but uh, she was around, uh, you know, to see it. And then uh, in the uh, 12 campaign, um, after the campaign was over, I jumped on the presidential inaugural committee, and that was a lot of fun. And so uh, I got a whole bunch of, you know, you get your tags and your clearances and all the other stuff. And so I was able to wheel my uh, mother, uh, you know, into the event. You know, you just look out and you say to your friends, hey, don't worry about it, it's my mother. You get them in, you put them up, right? Because all the big wigs come in, they all show up just in time, right? You know, they're nowhere to be seen when you're knocking on doors and making the phone calls, right? Or sending right. them. <laughs> the minute the cameras are there, they're there and they're like, uh, 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 at front and center. And so then you're like, hey, what about me? And then you wiggle your own people in. I'm sorry, those are just my experiences. But you, Brenda, I want to hear more because you were in Ohio and that was tough. It was yeah. it was a daily battle in Ohio, but we had to keep pressing on and pulling people in to help us. Mm-hmm. And the uh, I was a federal employee during this time, so you know those Hatch Act provisions, yeah. and you can't do this and you can't do that. And people always wanted to engage me at work, and right. I'm like, I have right. to walk away. I had to walk away from people every day to trying to. To do right. that, so I could, I had to be very, very careful uh, when I spoke of him and, and not. Right. And uh, but it was still such an interesting journey and historical experience. Uh, for the 08 uh, inauguration, mm-hmm. I uh, took a picture of my family and put it around my neck. I said, okay, now we're all here together to see this historical event. Mm-hmm. And kind of way, uh, I, you know those foot warmers, because it was so cold. Yeah. I was adjusting my boot on one of the hills uh, behind the reflection pool. Mm-hmm. When I looked up, my face was on the jumbotron. And I'm like, uh, I don't see a camera, but hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm that kind of person. <laughs> and then my phone blows up. Uh-huh. When I get home, my father said he's so proud. I'm like, what? What? They made him stand up in church. He said, your daughter is up there at the inauguration. And the pastor called his name and stood up in church and they clapped for him. 
and, and he got the biggest thrill out of that. Yeah. He was like, you told me you didn't care what was going to happen. You were going to be there and you did it. Yo, that's that's an amazing, um, you guys, and I knew I had to give you guys at least seven minutes to chop this up because I knew you had this thing in common and I really wanted this. This I really thought about it. I was like, okay, you know, I'm always in a position to be around such great people. And, you know, for whatever reason, the creator will allow me to let other people meet other people that have some things in common, you know. And and Bill, really quick, um, Brenda was also part of one of the early Ohio busing things where she was one of the first young black, you know, students with her sister to to break that that kind of barrier, too. But, you know, I'm glad both of you guys on the show, um, you know, two of my favorite people, um, you know, and 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 Bill. Um, goes back a minute with me, so he gets it. Brenda, you and I from another life, you get it. We're all kind of on the same page, but no pun intended. The elephant in the room, mm. okay, we're going to get into this, all right? Now, I'm going to just tell you my quick overview, and then I'm going to let you guys have it, man. Um, you know, as best as I can see, and also, real quick, um, prayers and thoughts out to the plane from Indonesia, I believe it was, that went down and God bless you guys. That was a, a something that happened last night. I, I caught the end of it, a plane. And apparently these planes that they're using are like 20, 30 years old. They can't afford new planes. And it's the second plane that, that crashed. I think the first one had 230 people that died. This one had at least 80 or 90. So my prayers and thoughts, to, if, you, if you're watching it, Indonesia, and I know a lot of people in Indonesia do watch the show. I, I, my prayers and thoughts, I did not forget you. Okay. Um, but the, the now to me it wasn't a protest the riot at the capitol the right to vote they lost the vote systemic racism jobs equal economics to less empower people that was my structure and i think that's what that was all about let's start at the top um miss woods obviously um what was your 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 overall feeling not opinion. I want to know how you felt when you saw the disgusting act um, last Wednesday. Okay. My feeling was, okay, now I know. Uh, during uh, President Obama's second uh, go-round, when the people weren't getting out as they should have and voting and those issues, I wrote on Facebook, I wonder how people felt during Reconstruction, when they had property, when they had money, when they had political offices, et cetera, et cetera. How did they feel being used to that environment and then the start of Jim Crow? I hope I don't have to go through that because these people aren't voting and they're not being engaged. Am I going to be that person that remembers Reconstruction that, that now has to live in Jim Crow? When I saw uh, the, uh, the mess and debacle at the Capitol building, I said, now I know. Yeah. This is where we are now. And yeah. if we don't get it together, the second Jim Crow is worse than the first because you never knew how good you had it. And now it's getting ready to disappear if we don't do the right thing. Yeah. Can't sit on our hands and not vote, not vote and not engage and not question. We, we don't have that luxury. We can't do it. But that was my feeling. Now I know. Right. Bill. Yeah, the, well, First of all, it's just fundamentally an outrage. And I, I want to go through a couple of things really quickly. Just go, go, go. We got time, man. Just, just to identify and make sure that everybody knows. And I know that these points have been made uh, sometimes more eloquently than I can as we walk through. And that is simply this. We start with the uh, just the issue and the approach to police enforcement. For decades and you know generations, we've been saying that, listen, whenever it comes to a person of color, the police response is to start with death. 
and then end up with, oh, I'll see you in court, which is, oh, then here you can have, uh, you can negotiate and plead to a life deal. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. That has been it. It's either death on the spot or death uh, by a gavel. This at the Capitol was no more than an assault. It, if it was a foreign country, it would have been an invasion. It was an assault. And what we found was even after they brought in the forces, I understand maybe the Capitol Hill police were overwhelmed at the beginning. And so for them, for the purpose of their safety, they retreated. I understand that because they were outnumbered and we now know they were outgunned. And the other people had bombs and um, other incendiary things in addition to pepper spray. That's fine. So they withdraw to begin with. Then when all of the other uh, forces from Virginia, from uh, Maryland, the state police, the National Guard, they all showed up and they were clearing the people out of the Capitol. The video shows that they were acting like they were, uh, you know, having people exit from the amusement park at the close of Disneyland. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was that they were holding the doors open for them and then letting them out. And just like and these people were walking out, just like they had gotten off a roller coaster saying, hoo ha, hoo ha, oh, we did it. And they were still, chan- you know, doing whatever. And then social media just exploded with them showing how they were drinking champagne and celebrating like they had just been on a fucking like no, you're good. vacation. Yep. Now, yep. that's number one. And these people actually killed people. So the disparity in treatment alone is just outrageous and it's intolerable. And that will forever be a mark that nobody can argue about because we have the tapes. That's one. Two, when we talk about what they were actually doing and what the president of the United States did, he stood down just a a half a mile away and said, let's go march on the Capitol and show them with force and with Giuliani saying, now's the time for combat. That is a rallying cry for sedition and treason to have one branch of government put together a militia, which is what those people were. They were a militia, armed militia, and send them to invade the United States Capitol, both the House and the Senate, for the purposes of... stopping them from from certifying who we elected as a people. That is to nullify over 80 million votes. That's an outrage. That is revolutionary. Brenda, I know you talk about Reconstruction, but Reconstruction only came after the war. Imagine these consequences. I asked Zach for your audience, the simple sequence of events. Let us say that they marched, which they did, invaded the Capitol. Let us say that the Capitol Police did not retreat. Let's say that they began to use armed forces. We saw that one person got shot as a protection because they were attempting to break in where the uh, representatives of Congress are actually still in. So those officers were protecting lives when that gun was discharged on that one woman, who at that point was engaged in treason and sedition. So she was essentially one of, a foreign combatant on our soil at that point. Now imagine those police officers had shot back and done and treated it as if It were what it was, an invasion by uh, enemy combat forces. Then what you would have had is those forces would have said, see, there would have been like the police shot first and then they would have been in there shooting. We later found that they not only had guns, they had zip ties. The zip ties are used as a form of an immediate handcuff. So they were going to handcuff, hold hostages and all this other stuff. Lord knows what they had planned, but for the fact that they were caught and more people came in. Lord knows, but for the fact that that one person was shot, if more people had been shot, then they would have responded with more violence. And we literally would have had a civil war. And I cannot understate that enough. And we now find later, Zach, and then I'm going to hand it over to you guys again, but it's part of the outrage. We let Now it's out on social media that they were filming a Donald Trump's son, Jr., was filming the uh, the event in yes. the, before he took the stage, and they were celebrating. And that, moreover, reports have come out of the White House that after they marched on, President the president, President Trump, was in the White House watching on live television as all of this was going on with the breaking down, the overpowering of the guards, and he was celebrating it. He was cheering it on, and he refused to call the National Guard. Mike Pence, second in line to uh, the presidency, and Nancy Pelosi, third in line to the presidency, were whisked away by the Secret Service into the emergency 
protocol, a con continuity of government operations into the special bunkers for fear of their lives, because that would have been a coup, a decapitation, if you had taken out the vice president and the speaker of the house right then, and the speaker pro tem of the Senate, who was all in that room, and one fell shot. The only leader that we would have had left in the United States government would have been President Trump. It was an attempted coup. It was sedition. It was treason. He called for it. It's outrageous. And and putting on top of that the fact that it was those white people that were starting the war to put us back where we were back in 1860, even before Reconstruction, even before any of that other stuff. With pride, they carried the Confederate flag. And now we let them out like we were, you know, emptying an amusement park. And now everybody's saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize the consequences. Oh, I'm sorry, I embarrassed my family. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Oh, well, we were there, but we were trying to make a point. You made a point when you voted and you lost. Mm -hmm. It's an outrage, Zach. That's and right. It's really and, and, that it's an assault. Uh, it, 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 uh, no different than a foreign invasion. And it's criminal. It is. It is. And you know what? I said the same thing. And then I'm going to throw it back to Brenda. Um, thank you, Bill, for putting that so eloquently because you, you hit on some very key points. But when I didn't see him go out in handcuffs and then later on you watch the videos and you see people with those plastic things to cuff people and this and that. The first thing I thought about and Brenda and I had talked about this a few days ago on the phone, you know, because we were chatting about just some other stuff about, you know, the thing in Tennessee, which nobody pays attention to right. anymore with the, the RV. But I said, this is some kind of test. And and when I saw this and, and Brenda, I'm going to ask you to respond. I thought about Michigan. And I said, was Michigan a test run? Brenda? Yes, it was. And uh, this debacle that we saw at the Capitol, same thing. But the, the good, I try to find the, the good part in bad situations. The good part is people have come around. They are engaging properly. They're voting. They're they're doing these things to get this turned around. Imagine if Nancy was not in place. Pelosi was not in place. And all that's due to voting. Just imagine with the wrong people in the wrong places, where would we be today? Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, we're we're getting around to the the right uh, actions now with this uh, coup, attempted coup. And the more we find out about it, the worse this story gets. We don't know oh, at God, all. Oh, God, yes. God, yes. <laughs> but it's it's like, you know, it gets worse every day, every day. But thankfully, uh, it looks like we have the people in place to, to get this turned around in the correct way. But... Uh, He's got to go. Yeah. yeah. And just uh, saying, well, there are only a few more days before he's in. I wish they could have gotten rid of him yesterday. Same. He has Same. to go. And it has to be, we have to put a proper spotlight on who's who and what's what. And I love that analogy of retreating from an amusement park because that's the, the, the end of that situation didn't equal the start. Okay. So, so. All right. Well, you know, and, you know, Brenda. You know, it's always uh, I always like to point out that you know uh, Lincoln uh, always appealed to our better angels. Okay. Uh -huh. But implicit in that is the other side. Okay. And right now, you are our saving angel. I want you to know. But I, I just want to give voice to the other side, okay? And the other side says, George Floyd. We don't even, we know. We don't even know what it was all about. Allegedly, it was about $20, and whether or not it was a fake $20 bill. And he lost his life in slow, in a slow, agonizing 10 minutes, okay? That was over $20. Yes. They assaulted a joint session of Congress armed with guns, pipe bombs, Molotov cocktails, ready to do damage. They exhibited this stuff in Michigan with the plot to kidnap, try, and murder 
the governor of Michigan. There was a plot in Ohio. The guy in Tennessee blew up his RV, and it took him time to plan all that and pack that thing up to do the destruction that he did. You see it all over the place, and nobody is doing anything. So George Floyd loses his life over an alleged $20 bill, and they sought to bring down the government. And now everybody's saying, oh, well, uh, Donald Trump just kind of misspoke. He didn't misspeak. That's right. That's right. He wanted them dead. And he could have cared less. And that was the closest we came. There was that show a couple of years ago, A Designated Survivor. Yeah. This was the reverse of that. Just think about it. You had the three people in line to become the president of the United States in the absence of the president. You had the vice president, the speaker of the house, and the next one is the most senior senior serving person in the United States Senate, all in one place, an angry mob armed and ready to burn down the Capitol. Those three people out, then Donald Trump's the president. He invokes martial law, and then we're off to the races. That's the most important. And it's an outrage. And it's an outrage not only as a citizen, it's outrage as a person of color. And I'm tired of it. And, you know, I do want to say this, Zach, and I appreciate it. And, Brenda, I really do appreciate you, and I'll tell you why. It is always African-American women who save the soul of this nation. They really do. Yep. Because it's this other part of our soul, which I'm giving voice to right now, that is so angry that would respond in like kind, but it's only the soothing words from angels like you from from every generation that stops us from the very edge. But at the end of the day, they are criminals. And the way we treat them now says as much about us as a nation, what we choose to do and what we choose not to do. It's great to go after the ones that, you know, uh, took their pictures in the, in the, you know, the horned hat, and put his feet up on the yeah. desk. It's great to get those. But what about all the other ones? They didn't go alone. We should have them all wrapped up. And that rally looked pretty large. So telling me that there were 15 arrests is just like saying, oh, we emptied Disneyland and we only caught those people that were peeing outside the bathroom. Yeah. Sorry. But and, friend- and, and, and I agree. And, and what I was going to add to that is that um, – what, and, and we were talking about, you know, how everybody felt. And again, thank you for hanging out. I'm here with Brenda Woods and Dr. William Bill Tresvant, and this is Funk from the Front Seat. I'm going to bring Mark in in a minute, in about another two, three minutes. Obviously, we're going to go over a little bit, but that's firstly fine because this is a very important subject. It's it's only the second time in my lifetime that I ever actually felt threatened on my own soil. And I'm not talking about races, clan, or none of that. I actually literally lived through 9-11, and I know what that's like. I was on a plane the day before, okay, um, on the one that went down in Pennsylvania. I was going to Hawaii the day before. So I know that feeling of, wow, you just missed something. This, And, and I told my daughter this yesterday, um, and we were chopping it up. And, and you know, I told her, you know, I was having you guys on today, and she's probably watching now. So if you are, hey, Kayla, hey, Maya. Um, I, I, I felt when I actually got a chance to see my daughter, I felt even worse. I was hurt already for you, Brenda, Bill, Mark, and all of us. And then I was hurt for all the kids that I didn't know. But it really didn't hit me until I hugged my daughter yesterday, right? And when I hugged her, I could feel her pain and emotion. I could feel my pain and emotion. And I'm trying to just if exude that positive thing and put a positive spin on her generation. But my heart was completely sunk in a place that has not been since 9-11. And I know it took 15 years for everybody to overcome that. I am still overcoming 9-11. Um, and this wasn't in the major scheme of the deaths. But what what triggered me was the 375,000 people that are dead. And then we're doing this. And I'm like, how can we, even as you can be the lowest, sluggish, snailish, immoral person on the planet, but as the commander in chief, are you now willing to say the 375,000 plus deaths and the over a million, two million cases and this capital storming of terrorism, domestic terrorism, this is me, this is how I'm going out. How in the world, Brenda, and I'll let Bill, and you guys can jump in. How in the world 
Can you look yourself in any mirror if you are that man today, Brenda? What do you think? What goes through your mind, guys? Tell me. You know, it's it's got to be a, a mental illness. Thank for you. someone to have such disregard for life. <laughs> Love you. That that's the only uh, that's the only answer I that I think it could be. It's 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 not moral. It's not human. It's not reverencing anything. A uh, difference between right and wrong. It's evil, and I guess evil incarnate. That's what I have to say. Good, Bill. I wanted to tell you. I'm looking at Malcolm. Looking at me. Okay, and he's got, and you see that picture back there, Brenda, of Malcolm, that Bill got back there? Every time I interview Bill and he comes on my show, I see that. And what? And I'm going to ask you this, because Malcolm is asking me to ask you, <laughs> what would Malcolm do? Okay, you got to ask which Malcolm. Before, X. First, hang on, first, before he went? Uh, or... no, no, after. Okay, fine, after. And he set up his own mosque. Okay, that Malcolm... Uh, would have would have said would have would have called for peace. He would have called for cooperation. He would have called for understanding, and he would have called for civic activism. He would have said, you know, he would have he would have said no to violence, and uh, and clearly walked away from that. But he would have been militant about being uh, activist in our in our civilian role and our roles as citizens, which is voting, which is counter protesting peacefully, uh, which is um, holding your government officials accountable. All those things that we can do that are our right. At that time, it would have been picking up the phone and calling and sending letters. Today, it's emailing. It's uh, letting your voice know on by tweeting. It's by doing podcasts or shows like this. It's by calling the representative repeatedly, sending them emails repeatedly, showing up at their town halls and demanding, you know, uh, that they respond. Because at the end of the day, that is our right. People make it it's almost seem like, you know, uh, they, they vilify us when you show up and you ask a tough question of your congressperson or woman. It's like, what are you talking about? Your job is to answer my questions. That's why you have this town hall. This town hall is not meant for me to show up just so that I can be window dressing in your next commercial saying that you're down with the people. Okay? You're not down with the people unless you let me talk and ask a question. You may not like the question, but it's the question I have, and that's the job you signed up for. And if you don't like me asking you tough questions, then go find another job. Somebody else will jump in and say, and maybe they'll want to answer my questions. You know, it's so funny, Zach, and I want to remind you. Um, when we were doing the uh, the election night coverage, yeah, and, yeah. I was listening, and uh, Zach was one of my guests. Brett, I'm going to tell the story just partially to embarrass Zach, but partially because it's funny because he keeps it real. So <laughs> we had a mix of, uh, of people on the show uh, from all walks of life, up around, you know, everywhere. Everybody was represented. And so there was this one gentleman who, uh, high income and obviously from the conservative side of the political spectrum, you know, white and everything else, and in came Zach. And Zach was asking about the questions. What about the homeless people? And, you know, and people were looking around and they were looking at me and I was the moderator. And I was like, this ain't. Zach, you're cool. And I was looking at that world. People were looking at me like I was saying, uh, you know, and I figured it's all fair. He's in, he's in. And so for his part, he engaged Zach and I let them go for about 10, 15, 20 minutes on these yeah, hard yeah. policy issues of homelessness. Now, some people would have seen that as me being a bad host. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is an open political discussion. And he, he gets to ask his questions. Let's see if he can, you know, come to the fire, see where you're cooking. Can you cook or can't you cook? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Remember that, Zach? Yep, because I everybody that knows me, and I even told Brendan this when I first met, I was like, I come in hot. I'm coming in hot. I, I'm like that plane. We're going to land, but eh, it's going <laughs> to, the, the wheels are cut. <laughs> right, right, Yo, right. Mark, I got to get you in on this next segment. We're going to continue. I'm not going to do any kind of ended, Mark. We're just going to roll. We're just going to keep, we, we just gonna keep it rolling. And one of the things I was getting ready to say is, uh, <laughs> and I'd love to hear what Bill's got to say, but as I was hearing y'all backstage, listening to everything that folks were saying, one of the things that occurred to me is the injustice of the way that these folks that 
uh, stormed the uh, Capitol, and that's what they did. They stormed the Capitol. They definitely tried to uh, lead an insurrection, as you called it, Bill, and I totally agree with you on that and everything. But they are getting no sort of, like, true justice in my mind. I mean, these folks should be, as you said earlier, charged with treason, charged with sedition, charged with a number of other things that they could be charged with. And one of the things that I've been thinking about for the last several days, and I'm going to date myself here and everything, but I know Bill can relate to this as well, is I'm in my late 50s, and many of us remember that in the late 1960s, I was a kid, I mean, a little kid, but I studied history and everything, there was a major disruption of a Democratic Party event in the election of 1960. And those folks were treated like dogs. I mean, I remember seeing the trial of Bobby Seale where he was tied up. He was muzzled. He was done a number of other things. And that's what I feel that we're going to be fair in what's going on. These folks need to be treated the same way that Bobby Seals and the members of the Chicago 7 were treated right. some 50 years ago because that is what they claimed they were doing in 1968. They claimed that they were disrupting the country and all of that. But I'm like saying, yo, so y'all are going to give these folks a slap on the wrist. And that's basically all no, I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, and, what, what and, yeah, and Mark, you're absolutely right. But what I wanted to do, I want to end the beginning. So thank you guys for joining in. No, no, thank no, you. No, 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 we're still there. We're, I'm still going. I just got to end this segment. And then we're just going to keep rolling. Yeah, just hang out one second. Um, a word to our sponsors. Thank you to IBMTV.TV, um, Lynn Shepard and the Dollar Store. Mark, we don't have to run the end credits. We're just going to keep this rolling. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Funk Music with Zach. As we're going to now go into this overtime roundtable with my special guest, Miss Brenda Woods, um, Boosie Funketeer, um, Ambassador, Club Funketeer Ambassador with Patricia Collins, social activist, um, Dr. William Bill Tresman Esquire, lawyer, and all the list of accolades he has behind him, and my producer, Mr. Mark Lee, radio show with Mark Lee. You can catch all this stuff on his web pages. The question, and thank you, the audience all around the world, peace, love, and harmony is my mantra. The question I have, and I'm going to start with, with ladies first, Brenda, the slogan, two different Americas, has been thrown around for 450 years, all right? It even got more prevalent Jim Crow, and then it got more prevalent um, post-68, 69, more prevalent in the 70s with unemployment, with housing issues, with what they quote unquote call the ghetto, the slums. They came up with a name just where poor people live at, mostly black and Hispanic. Brenda Woods, now in 2021, tell me your thoughts on relating to what you saw Wednesday with two different faces of America. Okay, and we go back to 67 and 68. I was old enough to remember those days. Mm. And so when I looked at this uh, parade, that's how they want to call it. I call it uh, a treasonous attack. Mm -hmm. My first question was, where are the police? Where are mm -hmm. the National Guard? And we get caught up, at least I do sometimes, on what should be versus what it is. Mm -hmm. When I saw the uh, some of the uh, police officers moving uh, barricades out of the way to let them in, I'm like, how does that happen? These people are attacking the United States, and they're letting the they're letting them in. They're letting them do it. When you think about the Black Lives Matter uh, events. The National Guard was waiting on those people to get there. Where are they now? It, isn't this Washington, D.C.? Isn't this the Capitol? Who can walk up on something like that in those numbers with negative intentions? And it just slaps you in the face, and you, you'd have to be blind not to see what the difference is. Thank you. You know, I'm thinking, is this an inside job? Was it already planned to be exactly what we saw? I don't think it was a mistake or a miscalculation. I think it was planned to be exactly how it fell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill, same well, question. Okay. Well, first I want to just point out and I want to pick up where Mark left off, and that is this, is that we do have it actually an actual example 
of how these people should be treated. It was mm-hmm. 54, and a young woman was protesting the treatment of Puerto Rico. And she uh, entered the House floor and demonstrated. She was not armed, okay? And she was by herself, but she protested. She was subsequently prosecuted and sentenced to 49 years in jail. That's how they handle that. And, that, and that's an actual legal case that people can go ahead and look up. And I have the site, but it's far away. I don't want to disrupt this flow, uh, and it's not necessary. But you could just look it up. A Puerto Rican woman was protesting, entered the House floor, subsequently prosecuted for uh, you know various crimes, and sentenced to 40, over 49 years in jail. Now, that having been said, to your question, to Americas, she was a person of color mm-hmm. protesting matters that dealt with people of color. On Wednesday, we had white people protesting the fact that they didn't like one white person over another white person. (laughs) And for that, they took guns, bombs, pepper spray, and they laid siege to the Capitol just so that they could disrupt the certification of one white guy. So they were all upset over one white guy. A woman was upset over the treatment of an entire race of peoples. Black Lives Matter this past summer, last year, was upset over the treatment of all of the peoples of color in the United States and around the globe. The Puerto Rican woman was sent to jail for 50 years. The multiracial group of Black Lives Matters, they were tear gassed. Mm-hmm. They were assaulted, including the press by the police. Mm-hmm. They were the helicopter was there just to escape any of the people. There were mass arrests, and there was violence and an active shove just so the president could go and take a picture of him holding the Bible upside down. That is the two Americas: yeah. jail, mass arrest, tear gas, oppressive, overwhelming force. Versus, as Brenda decided, they opened up the gate. Some of the guards took selfies and let them in. And no one seemed to care. And now they're treating it literally as if this was a big fraternity prank. Oh, boys will be boys. But in this case, oh, well, upset, racist, supranationalist, conspiracists, Nazis. Ah, well, they're just good people, as the president said. It was just an honest mistake. It's a movement. uh, Well, we'll just let them, you know, do as it is. Yeah, it's crazy. Through Americas. And then after a while. No, it's definitely. Mark, jump in there. Jump in there. I'm going to ask you the same thing, and then I'm going to give it to you. But I just wanted to ask you the same thing, Mark. As far as two Americas go, as well as the idiots that were walking around with German Auschwitz shirts on and hoodies, that say um, four million is not enough. Four M E N, which means four million Jews that perish, or whatever the number was, is not enough. Or six million, whatever it was. Um, and Mark, I know this is near and dear to you. That's why I'm rolling like a three part question for you. But the Confederate flag in the Capitol building, and I'm gonna just leave it there. You can roll with it, bro. Well, one, I'm going to say that if you don't think that there are two Americas, I'm going to show you all something very quickly and everything. And it's something I've always brought up every once in a while. But right there is what we are facing. That is the the amount of hate groups in 2019 that exist in the United States. There are 2019 hate groups across the U.S. And they, as you notice, scattered in a lot of places, included in my beloved South and right here in the North Carolina. You can oh, see I knew they was here. I knew yeah. they was here. And they were in Georgia, where we know we just dealt with a major race and everything. And yes, I hate to tell Jeff this, there are even quite a few of them in California and throughout the country. So definitely it is something that we face on a regular basis. And like I said, that was in 2019. This is 2021. 
I would actually argue that we have probably seen even more groups that have popped up since the election and all of that. So, like I said, I think that that was 941 or something like that was the amount that they said existed and all of that. I would actually argue that it is probably more than that even now because they said 940 to be exact. So that is what we are facing when we talk about uh, what's going on here in uh, this country. And yes, um, I am definitely... Um, here in the South, was born in North Carolina, so I know about those Confederate monuments, and as far as I'm concerned, they can all leave. They can all go to, like I said, I'm not even sure I want them in a museum, because that's just like adding to a couple of the uh, attitudes that some of those folks have, and things of that nature. I mean, I would not be uh, opposed if they wanted to go find the Monitor and that other uh old battleship and dump them down in the ocean with them. And Bill is laughing at me because I think he might have a similar viewpoint as well. So I would have no problem with them just going ahead and like, you know, drowning those monument statues. I definitely have no problem with the changing of names. I actually watched the team play yesterday because they got smart. And yes, I do have some Native American blood in me as well. And they got tired and got a lot of abuse for being called the Redskins. So they are now the Washington team or whatever name they're going by. And everything. And uh, like I said, I have no problem with those changes of names and us changing a lot of those uh, folks that were um, honored in the past that had racist past and us changing the names of those institutions and things of that nature. So one of the things I'm curious about is I'm always fascinated when people hear about these great arguments and these things that happen. And like I said, I definitely agree that that was a terrorist act, a sedition act. It was definitely a case of an insurgency trying to take place. And I've even heard folks, and I'd love to hear Bill's comment on this, that have said that they feel that in this week coming up, and we still got 10 days to go till the new president comes into office, that the current person in 1600 could try to declare martial law. I hope that that is not something that happens, which could then postpone the inauguration. But I've actually heard that kind of like conversation going along, and I've heard that from a number of folks. So, Bill, I guess I'll toss it to you. Is that even a threat of a possibility that he could declare martial law and that we might have to put up with this madness for even longer than we're facing right now? And please tell me that it's not at all in the realm of possibility, but I don't put anything past people. And you are a student and a scholar. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because I have heard through the media that there is talk of him trying to declare martial law as uh, some way to stop the madness that he actually started. Right. Um, Well, before that, first, I just want to throw out some other terms just so that we can have the historical reference. When we talk about uh, Harper's Ferry, okay. Uh, that was just one guy with a gun, and all of a sudden that was cause for revolution. And mm-hmm. so you talk about John Brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that, that was, you know, with, uh, fighting on behalf of the slaves, and that, you know, was treasonous and sedition, and that was enough to, you know, hang. And right. now you've got thousands of people marching on, and they're like, no big deal. You know, the amusement park is open, and there's no social distancing. So just to add to your thing. So, Mark, you know, uh, and then when they talk about just a further – uh, support what you said before uh, the renaming of monuments or the extinguishing of other icons it's no different than what our founding fathers did before it was uh you know prince charles's parish it was you know king george uh, we weren't states what what they do the first thing they did was they got rid of all the royal references mm-hmm. they got rid of everything and they renamed everything to say that we're in a brand new world. So I don't know why people are so upset when we say we want to take down monuments to racism and fascism and, and, and discriminatory, you know, supremacy. I mean, that, that's just crazy. And it makes no sense when you put it in the context of what we did before. But rather now we're in the position where people think that somehow we're raising something that is indeed radical. Like somehow we're just coming out of you know left field. And no, it's not left field. It makes perfect sense and it's exactly what they did. It's they're the ones who are holding on to a fantasy in a bubble. That having been said, I use that as a segue to talk about a fantasy in a bubble. And that fantasy in a bubble is real. Uh, one, if you play it out, if the police had shot back and if they had gone in and they'd gotten their hands on the Speaker of the House or the Vice President or some members of Congress or some senators that they were targeting and they used the zip ties and they had them as hostages – then Trump would have been in a position to declare martial law. Now, his same crew is uh, has been in the mo- in, uh, planning, uh, at least according to published sources, such as uh, the actions by Twitter and Google and uh, Apple and Facebook, have been planning a secondary assault. 
to occur on Inauguration Day. Mm. Okay, And so with that, at that point, you're absolutely right, Mark. If that if that comes to pass and or there is uh, some other kind of major disruption before Biden is sworn in, then. Trump would still be in a position to declare a national emergency and impose martial law, at which point in time he would have total control. And that is real. And the reason why now they're taking, uh, uh, you know, paying attention to it is, for lack of a better term, and I want to be clear to the audience, listen, my mother is white and my father is black. I'm biracial. I by no means, uh, you know, come off as some radical on either side. But... What's happening right now is that white people were assaulted in their offices on Capitol Hill, and yep. now they're mad. Yep. Brianna Taylor was in her own house asleep yep. with her boyfriend, right. and she was assaulted with armed men mm-hmm. with guns in the middle of the night breaking in, and she is dead when she committed no crime. That was her house. And look how long it's taken for the white establishment to raise their eyebrows and say, we must have justice for her. Only after protests, only after it happens again and again and again. That's why we say, say her name. But it's been low and slow in order to get to that point. But the minute a white person in power is assaulted in their offices and God forbid somebody else put their foot up on her desk. Then you have. This notion, oh, well, he could declare martial law. Oh, now we have to do this. We have to do this immediately. All of a sudden, it's it's say Congress's name rather than say her name because they were assaulted. They didn't even lose their lives. And it was their office that got disrupted. And now they see the kind of anger and this, this, this craziness that has been going on that we people of color that built this nation have been suffering for over 400 years. And they say that it's suddenly somehow radically talking. No, we're finally saying, look, you guys are mad because they broke into your offices and they threatened you and they had these same plans. Meanwhile, we've been telling you that they've been stringing us up. We've been telling you they've been killing us in our homes. We've been telling you that they've been killing us on the streets. We've been telling you all this time. Yeah. And now they're like, oh my God, what else can this crazy white guy do? And now to quote Nancy Pelosi from 60 Minutes, a deranged, unstable president, a white guy is now threatening her and now she's like, oh, he's dangerous. Oh, he could use the entire government. What if he declared martial law before Biden is sworn in? We are defenseless. Well, that's how we felt the entire time. So, Mark, to answer your question, yes, there are real threats. That's why they circle, they, they uh, barricaded not only the Capitol, they barricaded the Supreme Court. They're barricading all the other places of Congress. They're barricading the White House. Because if this mob comes in again, It's not just this first wave. Don't think they don't have friends and family who are all out there celebrating, who are all, you know, rolling around in the glory of all this stuff. The first ones who turn themselves in, oh, they're now martyrs. Look how good they were. They turned themselves in. They realized they made a mistake. Let's pat them on the back. There's a whole other crew out there, the second wave, that see this as the moment. And they know because they've got the wink and the nod from President Trump, who that very afternoon said, okay, it's enough. You guys have had your fun. You've made our point. We've terrorized them. We've destroyed their offices. We threatened them. Now, I love you. Now go home and everything will be fine. And it was an amusement park. But they all went home and they're all just reloading. Yep. They didn't go home to say, I want to hear Brenda's thought on that. I like to hear what Brenda has to say. Yes. Well, basically, uh, we're uh, toe to toe on that. I'm in total agreement with everything you said. Uh, same set of circumstances present themselves, but they're dealt with in opposite ways. And it's, it, people used to say clear as mud, you know, it's, it's one path of justice for some and another path of injustice for others. And, uh, you know, it's like, how can anybody look at what is happening and think that they're both the same. It's impossible. 
because Brenda, if I remember correctly, there was an incident. It wasn't that long ago in Ohio, and I want to say the gentleman was just going out to get a sandwich and everything, and he was brutally killed. Has there been any more things that have happened within that case that happened? I believe it was last month, and like I said, they tried to claim that. Um, I know he had a uh, carry concealed uh, law um, right to carry his gun and everything, but they never found the gun on him. The only thing that I've heard he had was a subway sandwich. That's all I heard was a sandwich. And this is the thing that I hear people talking about, because I can remember when we couldn't freely get concealed carry permits. So when they opened up the process uh, several years ago and everybody could have a permit, people, uh, when they're pulled over by the police, that pops up. They know you have a permit before they walk up on you. Mm -hmm. But the treatment is different depending on the race of the driver. Mm. And, you know, you, you want to be law abiding. That's why you get the permit. But the way that you're dealt with is still that that difference depending on your skin color. Yeah. And you're in a catch with like you better not ever be caught with a weapon with no permit. But you have a permit and the same thing happens to you. So it's like, what do you do? Well, Zach, uh, Brett, just to, the same. Yeah, no, no, no. Just to help you out and, and mark out as well, because here's the other example. We have the, the shooting in Wisconsin. Right. Protest over the Black Lives Matter. The dude had an assault rifle. He was from Illinois and mm -hmm. he was protecting a gas station according to him. So he was 17, 18 years old. And he's like, he comes in from another state, picks a corner and says, I'm protecting this gas station. He doesn't know the owner, doesn't live in the neighborhood, doesn't know anything about anything. He brings an assault rifle and he self declares himself. And I know that's not even a word, but I mean, I don't even know how to say it. And then he ends up shooting two people. And then the video shows he walks down the street. He's got a long gun. Yeah, with the full automatic magazine hanging out of it, you see the major tanks coming in, the assault vehicles, the troop carriers coming in to deal with these unarmed protesters. And here's a guy walking down the street, and you got people saying he just shot two people. And the guy in the truck said, "Hey, buddy, are you okay?" And he said, "Yeah." And then the guy in the truck said, "You want a bottle of water?" To a white guy with a gun, while everybody else was saying he just shot two people. Well, they were on their way to deal with nonviolent protesters. It's crazy, but go ahead. I'm sorry, Brenda. I it just it no, but it, but it's been going that way for a long time. Like I said, we can go historically at the differences that have gone on. You mentioned Breonna Taylor, the fact that she was shot in her home. We can go back to the uh, founder of well, one of the founders of the Black Panthers, who was also shot in his home when in the early morning of his being asleep and everything. And they walked in there with the uh, FBI and some of the other agents and shot him dead. And there's a number of other historical cases, including Emmett Till and a number of others. So this is something we've been facing for a long time. And Medgar Evers, don't forget yeah. Medgar Evers, shot in his driveway oh, in, a, yeah. in the morning, having done nothing. Yep. There's so many historical figures that we've just are been brutally shot and killed. One of the things I've heard people try to put a difference between, and I've heard this argument going for a while, and I'd love to hear Zach, um, definitely Brenda and Bill, um, y'all's views about this, is they try to put a picture of what is the difference between a freedom fighter and a revolutionary? And that's one of the things that goes on when they try to do some of this wordplay that goes on and everything. And they'll give you examples. They'll tell you that maybe uh, Russell Means, who was a member of AIM, was more of a uh, freedom fighter for the uh, Native Americans. Or they'll use Yasser Arafat as uh, part of the PLO and things of that nature. And some of these folks that were marching in D.C. tried to paint themselves as uh, freedom fighters. I don't know what freedom they were supposed to be fighting for because there was definitely nothing going <laughs> on and things along those lines. But when you hear people try to use this wordplay and try to differentiate between what is a freedom fighter and what is something that is more of a terrorist. I said a freedom fighter and a revolutionary earlier, but it should probably be more of a freedom fighter and a terrorist as being the opposite ends of the spectrum. Because I have heard see, people say that one man's freedom fighter is another the man's terrorist. So, Bill, when you hear people try to give you that argument, how do you differentiate the fact of what these fools did in D.C. versus what some of the more uh, folks that were trying to make fundamental changes in their countries of injustice were doing? And then I'd love to hear from Brenda and Zach as well. 
Okay, very quickly. I mean, there's nothing new that necessarily I can say. I mean, I'll just be the most recent person to say it. But what comes to mind immediately is uh, how Malcolm dealt with it, uh, and uh, in you know, in many of his speeches. If some, uh, I hope, I, I really hope some people will. Everybody listens to it because he sounds uh, he's as relevant today as he was then. Um, but he said that uh, the difference is the way they're looking at it. And it's purely based on color because you had uh, Patrick. He used to call him old, old, old Patrick. He was a uh, uh, Patrick Henry mm-hmm. who uh, advocated revolution against the uh, British government. With uh, combat, with with arms, with bullets, he didn't advocate peace. And so Malcolm would say, "Yeah, what's that? Old Pat? He's a patriot. He's a patriot for their cause. But when I say it, I'm a revolutionary and I'm a criminal. It's funny. They yeah. say this this terrorist organization, militia, says that they were patriots. They just because." At the end of the day, if the if they're not prosecuted, then they get to declare themselves patriots. Mm-hmm. If they're prosecuted, then we know that they're criminals. And that's what we're dealing with right now. Because there really is no difference except who's in power and how they decide to treat it. And what we find, and this is a charge to my white liberal friends. It's right on them right now. Because to the extent that they come out and they say, oh, yeah, well, let's call for some measured response or some differential treatment, something that's not as harsh as the 49 years that that woman got so many years ago from 1954, with regard to how these people who were in the militia that assaulted the Capitol, they are just as guilty as promoting racism as the people that carried the guns and the Molotov cocktails. Yep. They really are, because all they're doing is they're saying for all of history that the same actions that domestic terrorism, for example, Timothy McVeigh mm-hmm. blew up an entire federal building, mm-hmm. killed 800 people. He was a domestic terrorist. But in his mind, he came from this very same cause. And I want to point this out, and then I'm going to hand it over, and that is simply this, that here is the difference between the two different camps right now. It's not our differences are not intractable except for the following. We acknowledge the problem and we know. We say, okay, we understand our mistake. Maybe we should have acted sooner. Maybe we should have done more. Those things in judgment we can change. And we can appeal to our better angels. And Brenda points them out, as does everybody else. And we can say, okay, let's do this better. Next time we'll know better and we'll do better because to know better, be better, do better. Their side, the only way they change is they say, oh, okay, well, uh, I promise I won't do it again. And then they do it again. Look, they cannot change. And these were their own people. It wasn't Black Lives Matter who they demonized and called for overwhelming force to put down. They called for martial law with Black Lives Matter. These were their own people. And now they're calling for some measure of leniency and, you know, forgiveness for these people as they marched out and they celebrated the death of a Capitol Hill police officer who didn't, who served in Iraq and didn't die there, died at their hands in the Cathedral of Democracy. And if my white liberal friends defend any kind of reasonableness or leniency towards these people, they are just as guilty at this point. And it was, it, look, it was John Lewis who said, people are going to ask us, the kids, our kids, our grandchildren are going to look back on this, particularly because we're in the age of media. Now everything is on tape. Mm-hmm. So they will know where we were. So they don't necessarily have to ask us. They'll just Google, where was Bill Trezevant? And they'll pull up all the videotapes and say, where were you on the issue when this stuff happened? How did you react? How were they to be treated? Were you for our national democracy, a multinational multiplex of races, religions, ideas, where everybody is welcome to the table, where you fight against those that would destroy the very society that we have built through blood and terror and our own treasure, meaning our children and not just the money? Where were you? When these people invaded, when these terrorists tried to take over, 
where were you on the issue? And if anybody finds themselves on the side of the law that says, oh, this is no big deal, they are just as guilty as the criminals themselves. That's where I stand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'd love to hear from uh, Miss Woods as well and see what she's got to say about what we were talking about. One of the things I was just going to add to that was that I remember watching, I think I told Zach this recently, I was watching a documentary about the um, the son of the gentleman that wrote the Turner Diaries. And you earlier referenced right. Timothy McClay and things of that nature. And the son actually has come out that he was definitely physically abused and was definitely um, had a lot of bad things happen to him. And he's actually come out against the things that his father did and all of that. So he's actually come out himself on the way he was trained because he was actually trained very much as a racist, not supposed to have any dealings with any minorities whatsoever and was actually physically beaten when he was even... Uh, Going like I think he was saying that he wanted to play football or play some sport, and his dad was like, "No, that means you're gonna have to be in the gym with the various other uh, folks of other nationalities and the other colors." So he's actually come out very much against that and all of that. So it was a very interesting documentary that I saw about three or four days ago. But it's just fascinating when we see these people that have written these books that are still being used to this day. That book was written also in like the 60s or the 70s. But some of these racist groups are using this as kind of their uh, um, blueprints for some of the things that they've done. Because I want to say that the McVeigh attack was actually kind of like um, foretold in the, the Turner Diaries, if I remember correctly. No, you, you actually do. And actually, I just want to add this one thing because uh, it, it is so ironic. And that is, and I got you, Zach, and I'll let this go, and then we're going to go to Brenda and Zach. And I apologize. But it's simply this. Uh, Nat Turner was prosecuted. You know who the, uh, uh, and you know who the prosecutor was? He was a young man named Trezevant <laughs> and put him in jail. Just to put note, I just, because it's so ironic. And it's in, it's in, uh, you know, it, it's, well, whatever. It was a Trezevant that prosecuted him at what? that time. But Zach, no, I was going to go to Brenda because I know Mark had asked her the question, but then he jumped in. So right. I was going to go to let Brenda get her point across. Yes. Okay. I think the the glaring thing that's in the room, you have one event, and it's, you can't straddle the fence between right and wrong, mm -hmm. or good and evil. You can't sit and say and do nothing when you see evil and call it good. Just because you call it good doesn't make it good. And these people, like you said, that go along with things that they know or that are not correct, lie for people, they're enablers. And enablers are on the side of evil and injustice. Well. Wow. Great point, and you said a very powerful point that you're making, Brenda. That's actually one of the complaints that I had when the uh, first um, when Trump got elected and everything was I saw a number of enablers, and I hate to put it, but there were a number of enablers that came out of our church structures that tried to back this particular gentleman because they felt that he was um, coming out against certain kind of attitudes that they may not have liked. Like they may not have liked some of the things that um, Hillary was saying about the rights of um, folks that are coming out of the LGBT community or some of the other communities, whether that was abortion or a number of other issues that they tried to put their label on and things of that nature. So I do not have that great deal of respect for, uh, not saying all, but a lot of the prosperity religion kind of folks because they sometimes put too much money in their kind of like um, forefront versus kind of like dealing with the uh, elephant in the room to borrow uh, Zach's uh, terminology and everything. I, I was just going to say, I didn't want to forget, Mark, you had asked that question initially, right? Yeah. And I was, I was going to get to that because you wanted to go through all three of us. And my thing is this, right? And it's going to take me a minute. Yeah. I look at the word sedition, mm -hmm. all right? Sedition, conduct of speech, inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. I'll say it again, conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or a monarch. Excitement of resistance to or insurrection against lawful authority. Now, having said that, my thing is it comes down to one word, racism. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Because if this is all about somebody that didn't get a vote. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. It goes back to what Bill was saying in the beginning of the show. All right. So sedition, you have a riot, right? And I'm pointing all my arrows down. So just imagine down arrows. You have what's called a, a riot, which is a act of terrorism and treason. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fighting for the right to steal votes after this very same group used voter suppression and it did not work, all right? So a riot fighting for the right to steal or challenge illegally votes that have already been cast, the people have spoken. When they lost the vote, another down arrow, again, systemic racism goes back to the top. Why do they want to fight? They want to fight because they think they won something they didn't win. Why? Because systemic racism in this society, in America, is what rules. Systemic racism kicks into, well, if I am a racist and I can keep all the brown and black skinned people in a certain zone, in a certain economic, and I say that again, economic bracket, that will lead to less opportunities and better jobs for my people being the white people, which leads to poor economics in the black and brown communities, which then trickles down to another down arrow of poverty, inequality, and systemic racism for life. So the vote, and I do this as a V, because that's V in sign language, the vote coming all the way down the ladder to make it an illegal vote and take us back to Jim Crow, which the American people spoke against and fought hard for that. Even white people, a lot of them, and and brown and Asian and black and gays and straights and everybody. And y'all know me. My daughters are biracial. My youngest daughter's a lesbian. So I ain't got no problem with none of that. That all came down to crazy, and I'm going to say it like this, crazy ass white men wanting to keep the country like it was in the Jim Crow era. So all of this other bullshit that they mask around and Congress and Senate and the judges and the Republicans and the Democrats, all total bullshit. It comes down to the white people wanting to, not all, but the ones in power wanting to make sure we stay in a poverty pit, which now the, the the overthrowing and the e, e, um, act of treason we watch unfold with our very eyes on national TV and then nothing happens to these people but a slap on the wrist. I heard the guys only get a year. I'm like, a year? I was like, you got people that sold a nickel bag of weed in jail for 30 years. Yep. Just to feed their family. And now a year, and this guy is basically like taking us back to the Civil War with automatic weapons and pipe bombs. Mm -hmm. So the trickle-down effect of what this man has done, and we all told him he was going to do this, has completely wrecked the system. It has to be rebuilt. It's going to start to be rebuilt with Biden and with Kamala Harris and The fact, and I'm going to throw this back to you because I had to get this off my chest, that we won Georgia gives a big you-know-what to them and tells them we, the people, will not stand for it. And if you're watching around the world, I want you to know, in America, we're going to fight for this until our last breath. We will not stand for this. And I'm sure that Biden and Kamala, I got faith in them, have to have, and Bill, you can tell me this, a military plan in place. And I'm going to just leave it at that because what happened is that trickle down effect comes down to racism. Let's keep brown and black skinned people. Let's keep women. Let's keep lesbians and gays and transgenders in one bracket. We don't want them to make progress. They took something from us, even though most of these people, they couldn't even afford the bus ticket to even get to the White House. They spend thousands and thousands of dollars on weapons. Why don't you put that into your community and then maybe you would have something instead of stockpiling weapons? What the hell are you going to do with all these weapons? Because when the military gets a hold of their ass, I know I got family in the military. My my nephew told me it's a wrap. They're all going to die. So if you're watching and you on the other side, but get your shit together. I know that's right. Um, Bill, he actually brings up a point that I'm just curious. I want to hear Brenda's thoughts on this as well. But I know a lot of times folks are oftentimes talking about the fact that um, 
we're about to switch over in the terms of the percentage of black and brown people in terms of our uh, sense of um, demo, uh, like the uh, demographics of the society. So we're about to be a majority minority society, whether that's black, whether that's brown, whether that's yellow, whether that's whatever the different uh, minority groups are. Do you feel that this was a last stand of the desperate white male? I'm just going to put it that way and put it bluntly, because I do think that they have got to know that their days of being the majority are over in terms of like the sense that the minority groups are steadily growing. And if you put them all together, we're about to be the majority. Um, if we're not already there, it'll be very shortly. So what are your thoughts, Bill? Well, I have thoughts, but let me answer your question first. Real simple, because that's the easiest part. And the answer is yes. It is uh, the last stand. And, you know, um, on this point, at least for our audience, I'd like us to just take a step back and think in broader terms what it actually means. Um, Oftentimes, the fights that we have in politics are uh, the tip of the iceberg with regard to the fights that are going on in all the other sectors of society that they really, really care about. You know, and what I mean to convey by that is simply this, that, uh, yeah, we can fight over uh, and. Oftentimes, they're fine with letting uh, everybody fight. Those lower on the social economic thing fight over who's in office, who's politics or whatever. But uh, they're only concerned, that is the powers that be, they're only concerned about, you know, whether or not they can preserve their wealth and their authority. And that wealth and authority is run through the banking systems and it's run through the regulations and it's run through uh, real estate and all these other areas. Friends, the fight that we're seeing politically and the answer is yes, because black and brown people will in fact be the majority. Now, this is not to say that it's a monolithic group, but it is to say that things are different. And white people are going to have to join coalitions. They're not used to coalition politics. They're not used to any of that stuff. They're just used to walking in the room and saying, and therefore being, you know, this is their last day. However, we have to think about it and be smarter about the larger implications, which means what does it mean when you're a white guy running a, a banking corporation where your customers are people of color and they're the majority of the customers. And in one fell swoop, if they get mad at you, they take their deposits out, whether it's a nickel, a dime, a dollar, or $10,000, and they go to another bank, maybe a black bank. What does that mean now for a person who happens to be white, who happens to believe in the hegemony? and the importance and the inevitability of their own existence. What we now call, manif- what they call manifest destiny. What does it mean now when the majority population is a majority minority? What does it mean when it comes to real estate? When our majority minority, now we have doctors, we have lawyers, we, we've always had them, but now we have them in full force coming out. And now we don't have to, you know, we can speak on the same level. And there are enough of us to make a difference and to allow other people to make a difference and make room. Whereas before, uh, our forefathers and foremothers had to fight just to get one person to be in a position where they could speak and offer a different point of view. So what does it mean for finances? What does it mean for real estate? What does it mean for local control? What does it mean for the distribution of assets? What does it mean for all that when you have a majority minority population and they think about the world differently? Yeah. That is what they're scared of. And so, yes, this is the last grasp, but it's the tip of the iceberg. Iceberg. It's the public fight that they're having right now. Their last stand. And in some respects, it's also pathetic. I'm glad that and we're in better shape because I'm glad we're having this fight. It's like it's been burnt. It's been underneath. It's been simmering. It's been brewing. It's been right there. Now, the fact that they chose to bring it front and center, the fact that uh, Trump was, uh, you know, uh, Egging them on, the fact that all of his other people, that new senator from Missouri, Howley, or whatever his name is, you know, was up front and center thinking, yeah. that he was gonna, thinking that he was going to be the next presidential nominee in 2024. You know, all those guys. I'm glad they brought it up. We're having this fight. Now we're going to see, as Brenda, you pointed out, there's it's a clear cut thing. What side are you on? right or wrong. And in this case, it is as clear as mud. And so they picked that fight. We're having that fight publicly, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because there's all this other stuff that's going on. Because once we take care of this stuff politically, what's that going to mean? Because once we want, you know, we're in charge and, and, and these make different decisions, 
and they may not all agree. I, you know, I, I may disagree with Zach. Zach will disagree with Mark. I, you know, I, Brendan and I might be on one side and I'll vote you. It doesn't matter, but it's just a different dynamic where one white person can't come in or some one half white person can't come in and say, these are the rules and this is what's going on to, uh, today. It's a different dynamic. And so that's going to spread through marks, through markets stocks and you know where companies invest and how they manage their monies and all this other stuff and so it's the last gasp and there's no turning around which is why this fight is so important because at this point we have the majority of the people Mm -hmm. and the only thing that we're fighting right now is the perception of who's in charge yep and they think that they're still in charge and they're trying to tell us that they're still in charge that is a perception that is not reality. Amen. No, I, no, I definitely agree with you on that and everything. I did want to hear from Brenda, and I was going to bring up another topic that falls into what we're talking about, and I'd love to hear her stance on this because she is in Ohio, which is a uh, big city area where she's added everything. But before I get to that, I was just going to let y'all know that we've got all kinds of folks that have been giving us likes, including parts of the uh, family here that watch us on a regular basis. So I was actually just seeing their names earlier doing uh, – Zach show Lance had given a like doing the uh, funk music and everything. But I've also seen since we've been having discussions that we have gotten uh, comments from Nicholas Vandermark from uh, not so much comments, but likes from Nicholas Vandermark, Christian J Stein. And yes, uh, Bill, you'll be glad to know that our good friend, the Russian investor and the man from Canada, Sasha Starr, has also stuck in a like as well. So Sasha Starr has also said that he was enjoying the conversation and what was going on in that sense. I do know that in all the cities, and Durham is no different, and that's where I am at, as well as Zach, we face gentrification. And I had a young lady on one of my shows that is also from Ohio, and she was talking about how gentrification is impacting a lot of what's going on in her area. So I'd love to hear from Brenda your thoughts about gentrification and how you're seeing it being dealt with in, I believe you're in the Cincinnati area, if I remember correctly, but how is gentrification impacting the way that we are developing as a people as well? I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Okay, yes, I'm I'm here in Cincinnati and we had a big issue with the placement of the soccer stadium. Uh when they were shopping around for locations, uh the predominantly white neighborhood said, Not in my backyard. Mm-hmm. So wow. they went down to the West End, which is predominantly black. And these, uh, the population that lives in that area typically are not homeowners. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing, when you're a renter, you have no power. Mm -hmm. I guess as an American, you still have a voice, but when you get down to the table, renters have no, no power. And they went in and now we're looking at a stadium that's almost finished. Those people were unceremoniously kicked out of their housing. And once again, we see might makes right. The big guys, the owners, they had everything and those poor people had to get out by whatever means they could muster together. So it's it's a very sad situation. But uh, that's what's happening in Cincinnati, and the uh, stadium's just about finished now. Wow, so that's sad. Uh, that's sad. You know, they, had, they went through the process. They had the public meetings. They had all that. And I went to them. Uh, I was just interested to see what the process was and uh but i knew from the very beginning if you don't own the property you don't have a voice yeah and that great. goes ties back into financial situations mm-hmm. we got to do something to change our mindset to become owners and not renters yep it's not going to happen talk- overnight that's right. No, I was just saying, Mark yeah, and I so talk about that all the time, happening. but you're right, Brenda. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's happening down here. If you're not an owner, 
right or wrong, that's how it is. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Zach, share a little bit about what we've talked about, because we've actually talked about that ownership thing, like you just mentioned, and definitely the fact that we face uh, living in an apartment complex, the uh, daily threat of what goes on in terms of our own finances and renting and all of that. So I know that we've talked about this. I'd love to hear you share it with the audience as well. Well, I I think because, you know, um, and, and, you know, homelessness is my passion. That's my thing besides racism. You guys know that. But to, to keep it short, I, I think economically, when somebody is unceremoniously, as Brenda so eloquently put it, moved from their place of residence that they've been, they've built a community, they're part of it, they work in that community. What happens is it's a double-edged sword of, of, of genocide, in my opinion, because now you've taken people, be they black, brown, Latino, whatever, out of an area where they actually work in, you have to move them to say maybe even a worse place or a place far away. They can't even get to their job. Now I know this because this is what I do besides music is Uber. So a lot of times I'm picking up a single mom that has worked three fast food jobs at 1030 at night and I have to take her 15 miles away, right? And she's like, yeah, I used to live here, close to the McDonald's I work at, mm-hmm. so I can catch the bus. Now I live 25 miles away in Apex because it was cheaper for me and my kids to live there because we had to move because, like you, Brenda, they built the stadium and they built these million-dollar high-rises right down the street from where Mark and I live at, right? Now, when you when you do that to a certain category of people and over the decades – First it was slavery, then Jim Crow. You're still doing the same thing. You're calling it different things. It's just a modern version of slaves over here, rich people over here. That's all. And then you got the people in the middle that have broken through that are trying to give back like the LeBron Jameses of the world. But for the most part, when you take somebody's home, Joe Biden said this, and I was so happy he said this. A home and a job, and or, or, or let's just say a roof and a job, Mm-hmm. about a woman or a man or their family's dignity. Mm-hmm. It's a mental psyche thing to see mom and dad go out that door every day to make a living. And when mom and dad can't do that and the children see that, the children actually give up. Mm-hmm. Because they know if my mom and dad can't make it, how in the world am I supposed to concentrate, focus, have food, have this, that, what? And don't think the kids don't talk because I know I got two daughters, 12 and 16. I talk to them all the time. I know they talk about what I talk to them about. You know what I'm saying? And gentrification and the fancy word of, hey, let's just take the land. You know, let's just take it. We're not even going to, we're going to change the code so the asbestos around the pipes in your old house is not good enough now. Now you have to move. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. We're going to run a water main through uh, eminent domain. We need this property so like corporation can run their spillage through your neighborhood and you can catch cancer or your kids can die. That is the most underhanded corporate legal lynching, and I call it a lynching, of our people still. Everything comes down to racism when it comes to that. Because, Mark, you know here in Durham, we always talk about the homeless. And I tell people all the time, I slept in my car and on Mark's floor. And I was working three jobs to try to save up my rent. That man right there, I slept on his floor for like two weeks. And in my car in a blizzard because I couldn't afford. And I was working three jobs. Right. So I know firsthand this is why I'm so passionate about homelessness. I know firsthand when you make people uncomfortable and you take their house, this grandmother and generations been living in this house for 40 years. Now, all of a sudden you take it from them. You've taken their life, their livelihood, their dignity. And most of all, you've taken their self-respect. Yep. Bill, what you got to say about it? Because I know that gentrification has definitely been impacted in D.C. and even your home area of Buffalo. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on gentrification as an important issue of what we're going through as well. Well, uh, I, I have two observations. One, uh, Zach is absolutely right. Uh, two, uh, the evidence, uh, the the result of it is exactly what Brenda described. And it uh, it's utilized. They use it 
it's exercised through eminent domain. It's exercised through the change in code violation or codes, so that suddenly what what was okay uh, one day suddenly the next day suddenly it's not up to snuff, and therefore a violation of such serious nature that it needs to be acted upon immediately. All of a sudden, when for forty years it was no big deal. Um, that's all a matter of, uh, of at least in some in many respects who's sitting in local government and as the population changes as you mentioned earlier with a majority minority certain communities are going to begin to see uh, the uh, the result of that um, interestingly enough one of the first states that has that's going through this transition is the state of California mm-hmm. which is now which has been for at least five years a majority minority and you're seeing that because the uh, person that they appointed to replace Kamala Harris is the first Latin American senator in the United States history. And that is a nod to the fact that the state is now a majority minority state. So they didn't go back to some other white person or something else. It had to be a person of a, a not previously not represented class, which we know to be, you know, people of color. I mean, we've got all these names for ourselves, except uh, the one name that means the most, which is I'm an American citizen. You know, and on any given day, I'm an underrepresented population. On any given day, I'm a minority. On any given day, you know, I'm I'm part of the uh, dispossessed. On any, it's like, well, what day do I get to be an American citizen? Right, right. You know? right. <laughs> but don't mind me. So in the meantime, they give me all these labels except the one that I have that is the same as theirs. And now I think to the extent that we can get this word out and educate our young and bring them along and help them understand the following. And uh, to, to the story that you, you talked about, Zach, I hear you. You know, it's so funny. Uh, Zach and I have this connection because I hear Zach sometimes. All I can write to him, the only message I can say to him is, I hear you. I know you do. Because I hear you. But here's the point. When they take our homes of 40 years, that the stories go around about, you know, I remember grandmama on the porch and whatever the stories are, or boo-boo used to do this, you know, or, you know, uh, whatever the names that are in our family, you know, mm-hmm. talking about well, one day and they, the kids came running right through the house because they were running from school because they had gotten in some scuffle down the street and who knows what, and the neighbors were mad and everybody was involved. And everybody came out on the porch and they were yelling or whatever, but then they resolved it, you know? All of those stories taken away, all of that stuff that revolves around house, hearth, and home and the structure. You may not have agreed with the structure. You may not have agreed with, the, you know, what they should have been doing or whatever, but everybody knew that, that was a family because historically that's how we as a people and we as a community have grown. We've accepted those that were not of our blood and brought them in, adopted them. They're our own. They're part of our extended family. That's where the term brother of a different mother comes from because that's what we had to do when we survived because of the oppression from the previous 400 years. And by no means am I trying to talk about, you know, uh, some new regeneration like I'm, a uh, you know, uh, leading a rebel cause. I'm simply stating the facts. And if it sounds radical to you, it's because your head has been in a cave. The point here being that when you take our homes, you leave us without hope. When you tell us then to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we have no boots, you're stealing our hope. The way we change that is by saying, look, and we look at and point to Brenda and we point to Mark and we point to Zach and we say, look, these are people that you can rely on. These have hope. This is where you should be going. This is what we ought to be doing. There's going to come a day. And for us, we used to hear there's going to come a day. We're now the generation of we're in that day. When we're a majority minority. And now yeah. it lies on us. They've yeah. been waiting for generations. I stand on my mother's shoulders. I stand on my grandfather's shoulders. I stand on, they stood on their shoulders. I stand on a long lineage leading back to somebody who now has no name from Africa. Yeah. My last name, Tresvant, is taken from a plantation in South Carolina. Well, that's a fact. That's well, a fact. I did not know that. I learned something new. I learned something new every day and everything. I know we're going to wrap up everything very shortly and everything, but one thing that I was getting ready to share with Brenda and everything was um, I also had my near uh, 
Obama moment in doing the uh, first election, and I did make it to the uh, first inauguration. I actually ran across some of the uh, celebrities. I literally was with a friend of mine, a lady friend, and we happened to look over to the side and saw Katie Couric running around trying to cover the story, and then we hung out in the uh, museum, the Native American Museum, as well as the um, Aeronautics Museum after the inauguration. But I remember there used to be a place called Blue Coffee, which was run by a uh, woman from West Virginia, and um, he actually made a stop there and got the uh, famous blue velvet cake. Unfortunately, I had been out doing campaigning, doing what both of y'all do, so he was literally pulling off as I was coming there because I actually knew the uh, woman, Gwen, very well and got there a split second too late to actually meet uh, President Obama and all of that because, like I said, I had been out campaigning that day, and when I got there, they told me, Mark, you just missed him. He's big. You see that uh, limousine pulling off? That's him. So I got to wave at him, but oh. did not get to have that great conversation with him that I would have loved to have. So that was my near miss, but I did get to go to that first inauguration. And you were right. It was definitely cold that day, and it was definitely uh, a great crowd, and I enjoyed seeing all of those people gathered at that amazing event and everything. And I uh, was thinking about possibly going to this one this time, but with all the craziness, I don't think I'm going to go, but I might try to attend what apparently is going to be our first ever virtual inauguration because it seems like most of it's going to be a virtual inauguration, so I'll be watching it virtually. So that's what it seems like we're leaning toward. Would you agree, uh, Bill, that we're going to be heading to a mostly virtual inauguration? Yes, and I and, and I celebrate that just for our own safety until we can, you know, cause we got people out there buying guns. If they got guns, we get to get guns. Don't mind me. Yeah, well, I- remember, <laughs> remember, remember, you're the better angel. <laughs> you know, okay? And 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 I I appreciate that. And I, I try to be. And I, I'm just giving voice to those people and saying we're trying to be. But you know. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. And like I said, um, then I'm going to talk to this Zach and see what he's got to say about what he's going to be doing during the inauguration. But I do have to give him a little bit of sporting update as well. Cause you know, one of the things I do is an audio, uh, podcast as well and I was jokingly saying that I did not want Baltimore to be losing since my good friend uh, that I do that show with is a uh, Baltimore fan so Dean I hate to tell you this but Tennessee is actually beating up on Baltimore right now so you will be glad I told you I told you Derrick Henry's a beast boy that's my boy and I got a Tennessee hat I didn't wear it because today I'm repping Chicago but Tennessee that's one of my teams so yeah man Okay, well that's great because you know I you know my team was the Buffalo Bills and I we welcome. I mean, bring it on. It's cold up in Buffalo now, so bring on Tennessee. You guys are amazing. You're on a roll. I think y'all might actually get there. It's gonna be Buffalo and KC. Yeah, I think although so. Tennessee's gonna have something to say about it. Tennessee is definitely because Henry is right. That, that young man. That's yeah, Tennessee is tough, and if we also got to not sleep on Kansas City. Kansas City is going to be the really hard team to beat. I think they're going to win it all, but it's going to be between them three. But get, to answer your question, Mark, because I know we got to wrap, I just right. want to say peace, love, and harmony to everybody. Um, you know, and earlier on my show, you know, Bill and Brenda and Brenda and Bill, you guys are amazing. We're going to have to do this again sometime soon. To everybody out there watching, thank you for your patience and understanding we here in America our hearts are broken right now. We're all struggling mentally. Um, and if you're out there in the world, even in America, especially here um, in America, if you have um, some type of mental issue or you feel some type of way or some kind of pressure that we're all feeling, by all means, reach out to someone. Do not keep this stuff and this depression bottled up because in the back of our minds, we're going through and we're living through what Bill and Brenda and Mark have been talking about. Mm-hmm. So if you are out there and we're actually living it all together, and I'm 62, so I lived a little bit, know that I care, we care, we love you, reach out to one of us. You don't have to feel alone, trapped, and feel like America is eating you alive, even though it may appear to be that way. As or, Bill put it, it's or, an illusion. Or afraid to or afraid to ask for help. Go ahead, yeah. Jack. Yeah, yeah, I was just gonna add that. Thank you, Bill. Or afraid to ask for help. Um, so that's okay. And 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 you know, Mark has been amazing this whole weekend. And thank you, Mark, for, for doing your production work and IBM TV. You guys are amazing. My last thought is that we need peace, love, and harmony, and we need to try. Like Brenda said, and Brenda, I'm going to use your mantra to be the better angel. Although, if violence succumbs violence, you have to protect yourselves and your families. Stay peaceful, stay loving, and that's my final thought. 
Appreciate those final thoughts. And by the way, I was going to toss it to Brenda for her final thoughts as well. And also put up a couple of comments from some of our listeners. Sasha Starr was watching and he said with great pleasure. So he was actually enjoying what we were saying and said that he was enjoying the conversation. I've also heard from Ankit and he was enjoying the conversation as well. And then also Linda Marie Smith was saying uh, hello to the Funketeer community. Ah, yeah, Linda. So Linda was watching as well. Um, And we're not going to sleep on um, Brenda's Ohio team because even though she represents Cincinnati, there's another team over there as well that's over there in Cleveland, and they've got a game later on this evening as well. So we know that Cleveland's going to try to play against Pittsburgh, and we'll see what happens in that game. So Ohio is still represented in the playoffs, which is more than we can say for what's going on here in North Carolina because we don't have any teams represented at all. So that being said, Brenda, what are some of your final thoughts that you would like to share with our global community? Well, I'll just say in this uh, season of turmoil, we just do the right thing, come together and help others. We'll be in a much better place. Definitely agree with you that we've got to be in a uh, much better place and all of that. So looking forward to folks' thoughts along that line. Bill, I've been told that I need to wrap it up in uh, about 2.10. So I need you to give me five minutes of a soliloquy. And I know that you can do that. So any thoughts that you've got that can carry me on for five minutes? <laughs> okay, that's for five minutes, okay? I'll put this up. I'll, I'll start you guys off, and then we'll go from here. But this is about the that I want the world to know. We didn't get to be the shiny city on the hill unless we had the fight down in the trenches. The rest of the world, I understand that we look a a bit foolish right now, but what you're really seeing is you're really seeing the real patriots, the people that are committed to protecting a diverse, multiracial, multireligious democracy where people are welcome. That's what these last four years have been about. And that means help is on its way. In 10 days... The world, just think about it. We have the world's largest economy, over $23 trillion. And up till now, our leadership has been, uh, well, directing it in ways that were not helpful to the world. They have been engaging in policies that have not been helpful to the world. They have been pursuing actions and wealth in ways that have not been helpful to the world. And I'm here to say that we're back. And in 10 days, you will see a nation with its shoulders, to borrow some Chicago lines, strong shoulders behind the boulder, pushing forward. I, I got you, Zach. City of, city of strong shoulders. Pushing with $23 trillion for the right policies on climate, on the environment, on social issues, on diversity, on racism. So there is a degree of hope. And I have to say that I am optimistic that once again, we will be that shiny city on the hill. And we're not worried about a little fighting down here in the trenches right now, because if the fight they brought, it's the fight we'll have to do. It's ugly. It's unnecessary. And oftentimes people don't like how sausage is made, but they love the sausage. So America, well, the world, we're back. And I can see, just watch this when I say this. Everybody got a smile for me? Let me see the smiles. Brenda? Yep. Got a smile. Because yes. that's, that's all we want to say. That yeah. people, we're optimistic. I'm optimistic. In 10 days, we will have a new administration, and that will begin to, to see the change. And people of good hearts and like minds and better angels show up and shine at this moment. And I ask the world, after having been patient, to come join us so that we can help you and you can help us. Mark? I appreciate it. That was some great thoughts. And on that note, I'm going to throw it off to our good friend, uh, Sasha, and I'm going to throw up a couple of ads of his shows as well as Talking Upstream, and that's going to get us to the 210 mark that they were trying to get us to. So we've got a couple of quick ads, and that'll end everything with that note. So if y'all are wondering who Sasha is, this is who Sasha is, and this is what he's got to go with his chess show.